Thank you all for logging in from wherever you are. Uh, this is just to let you know that the session is being recorded. Um, we will hopefully use the recording for um, make the recording available to people who couldn't log in in real time. Uh, my name is Rahul Rao. I'm a lecturer in politics at SOAS, uh, University of London. And I also have an affiliation to the Center for Gender Studies, which is organizing, curating this set of conversations that we're calling the Transnational Dialogues on COVID uh, as part of the SOAS Festival of Ideas. Um, I'd like to get started straight away. I'm going to briefly introduce our speakers, and then I'll just set out some basic ground rules for how we hope to have the conversation. Um, and hopefully we can also, I have to apologize for all my neighborhood sounds. Um, I might shut a window just now, actually. Was that a nice intro? That was the ice cream van, as you probably guessed from the jingle. Um, one of the uh, delights slash hazards of working from home, as we're all learning, is that uh, the environment in which we work is not controllable in the ways that we might be used to when it comes to work or professional contexts or what have you. Um, OK, so my three guests today are, um, and you know, usually when you do a live event, you've got a panel and you have people sitting on the panel and you say from right to left or my right or my left. Obviously, I can't do that. So I'm going to go from east to west. Um, I'm making some assumptions about where people are geographically. I'm actually not even sure where people are with any exactness. But on the basis of where their um, life and work is situated, um, we have today with us Vidya Krishnan. Uh, Vidya is a writer and journalist focusing on health, human rights, and gender in South Asia. Uh, her pieces have appeared in a number of places, including The Caravan, which is where I first encountered her work, but also The Atlantic, LA Times, Hindu, Al Jazeera, and elsewhere. Uh, her first book, Phantom Plague, The Untold Story of How Tuberculosis Shaped Our History, will be published by Public Affairs in 2021. Uh, and I'm also very excited to tell people that Vidya is a SOAS uh, alumnus from 2010-2011. Um, my next guest, uh, based in South Africa, is Phoebe Kisubi Mambasalaki. Phoebe is a postdoctoral research fellow on the Global Grace Project, which is housed at the Africa Gender Institute and the Center for Theater, Dance, and Performance Studies in the University of Cape Town, as well as the NGO SWEAT. She's also a lecturer in the Gender Studies program at the Africa Gender Institute at the University of Cape Town. She has a doctorate in Gender, Media, and Culture from Utrecht University in the Netherlands. Her research interests are in critical race, gender, class, sexuality, public health, and decolonial thought and praxis. And she's worked in various fields, including those involving gender, HIV, and public health with agencies such as UNDP, UNAIDS, and WHO. Um, and then in the US, we have Donna Patterson, PhD, who's chair of the Department of History, Political Science, and Philosophy, and the director of Africana Studies at Delaware State University. Uh, Professor Patterson is the inaugural editor of the new book series, Routledge Research in Health and Healing in Africa and the African Diaspora. She's the author of Pharmacy in Senegal, Gender, Healing, and Entrepreneurship. She's written scholarly articles on pharmaceutical markets, African women, public health, Ebola, and COVID-19. She's currently working on two larger projects, one entitled Transnational Drug Trafficking, Drug Consumption, and Health, and a second entitled Ebola, West Africa, and the World. Her media commentary has appeared in various places, including Slate, Washington Post, Vox, Huffington Post, Foreign Policy, Delaware Public Media, the Appeal Pacifica and other outlets, and you can follow her on Twitter at Pharmacy Senegal. Okay, uh, Phoebe, just checking that the audio was clear for you. Perfectly. Great. Thanks, okay, brilliant. Um, so thanks very much to uh, Vidya, Phoebe, and Donna for joining us. Um, for the audience, the way we're going to do this is we are going to have a conversation among the four of us for about half an hour, 40 minutes. We'll see how we go. Uh, and then we'll have a Q&A session where um, people in the audience are invited to ask questions. Um, we have a chat room, which we can um, 
use for the questioning. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to see how many participants we have when the Q&A begins. Uh, and I will then either invite you to enter your question in the chat room and pick a few questions, uh, or I'll simply ask you to use the raise hands icon at the bottom of the screen. And uh, I will then name a participant and I'll invite you to ask a question. So I'm going to make a decision on that based on numbers and how easy it is to handle the question. Um, so what I was hoping is that we could structure this as a conversation from the very outset. So we're not going to do a kind of set these presentations from the panelists. But I did want to open by giving you all a chance to just maybe reflect for a few minutes on what your most immediate connections or preoccupations insofar as COVID are concerned. Um, obviously, this is a global moment. Uh, the globality at the moment has been, has sort of come through in the way global connection has shut down in various ways. But the way in which it's experienced is very different. The kinds of issues we might be thinking about might be very different based on where we are and what our uh, particular context and preoccupations are. So I wonder if maybe you could just bring us up to speed on what you've been thinking about most recently. Let's start with Vidya, and then I'll ask Phoebe and then Donna to talk to us. Thanks. So uh, I'm very excited to uh, be here. Thank you for inviting me. I love coming back to SOAS. This is not how I imagined to be there, but uh, it's, uh, thank you for having me over. So my immediate connection, um, well, around the time the uh, around the time the pandemic was uh, surging in Wuhan, um, I was uh, working on my book, which is also on a respiratory infectious disease, which India is the epicenter of, which is tuberculosis, and. Uh, the, the last four months have been this slow moving train wreck and uh, you watch this come closer and closer and I've been reporting on the pandemic uh, from India and uh, and at this moment after I've been reporting for around 20 years and nothing in my journalistic career uh, has equipped me to deal with what I what with this assignment it's uh, it's exhausting and then on top of uh, India's response, in particular, has been uh, we had a right wing. We have a right wing government in power, um, and the context within which the pandemic came to India was uh, January and February. Uh, there was a lot of civil unrest, uh, which was protesting uh, a new citizenship amendment law, which uh, uh, which regarded Muslims as secondary citizens. And while our civil liberties were being curtailed and scholars were being uh, arrested, uh, students were being attacked inside libraries, in colleges, in our national capital, in the midst of all of that, uh, coronavirus made landfall. And there has unfortunately been a seamless, um, I've argued, I've written about this in the Atlantic and in Caravan and multiple places that India's response uh, has seamlessly uh, kind of uh, intricately been woven with the kind of police brutality and the civil unrest that we were seeing through January and February. And now we are in the midst of your 56 days into the world's harsh lockdown. And uh, there has been a migrant crisis, the parallels of which um, these are photos. Uh, the photos uh, evoke a memory of uh, uh, books in which uh, books I've read about the partition when uh, uh, Pakistan and India were created. But more recently, uh, in my experience, I've seen this uh, while covering the Rohingya crisis, where uh, villagers would just walk for days. Uh, pregnant women will give birth and pick up the kids and keep walking. And those are the kind of things that are happening in our big cities. It's happening in Mumbai. It's happening in Delhi. And uh, it's uh, it's been overwhelming and exhausting, and uh, um, uh, we are learning on the job uh, as journalists. So that's where I'm at. We can't hear you. Sorry. Thanks for that. Uh, as you see, I'm not a consummate uh, organizer of online events. This is very new in my life experience, so I, I will probably there'll probably be quite a few glitches. Uh, Phoebe, I hope you 
caught everything Vidya said? Okay. Yeah. So, what I'm asking everyone is to to say something about what your most immediate preoccupations have been in relation to uh, the COVID crisis. David, um, thank you that, for that, Rahul. And um, I uh, really pleased to be part uh, of this uh, important conversation. And indeed, um, being preoccupied um, uh, by a number of things, but uh, I'll stick to one particular one uh, uh, for conversation, and that is, uh, you know, the title I sent to you um, in the abstract uh, in relation to this conversation. And that's the right to eat. And I say that because um, uh, I'm closely working uh, in my research project uh, with uh, marginal bodies, uh, with um, a group of sex workers, who are sex workers who have been hit the hardest um, uh, uh, with this pandemic. Now, um, in South Africa, um, uh, the first uh, COVID-19 case was recorded on the 5th of March and um, uh, on the 23rd of March, the president announced um, a state of national disaster and that lockdown would be imminent. Um, and on the 27th of March, um, a hard lockdown was implemented. We're currently at day 65. Um, of the lockdown having gone a little down from level five, which was uh, the highest level of lockdown, where only essential work um, was permitted um, to level four, where, uh, with a few liberties uh, provided in there. And um, with such um, uh, a mode being implemented in South Africa, where um, I, um, it's not one of the most unequal societies in the world. Um, it means marginal bodies are left um, uh, to fend for themselves, even with um, uh, implementation of um, uh, support. It's not near enough to meet its need. And sex workers who are in, um, in the informal sector on the margins of labour, it means uh, they're completely left out in the cold uh, with this regard to no access to um, uh, the income, but also no access to the formal support from the state. So that's what I've been preoccupied by um, uh, um, uh, with this pandemic. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Donna, over to you. Um, I've had a number of uh, preoccupations. I think. Um, Kind of going back to the beginning, uh, like Vidya did, going, when it when I first saw it in Wuhan, I knew that it was gonna spill out of China. I knew that it was gonna go throughout the world. You know where it ends up, who knows? How many numbers, who knows? But I knew it was gonna come out. So looking at it from the perspective of living in the United States and looking at the response, I want to say lack of response, but we'll, we'll get to that. Um, looking at the response, you know, the slow response. I mean, one of the first decisions that the president of the United States made was to ban flights from China or ban Chinese from coming on flights from China. And I was thinking, this is not going to help. It's still going to come. We have to prepare. We have to do something kind of real and sustained. We have to think about, you know, what we're going to do, because this is going to definitely be some sort of pandemic. Uh, very likely. Um, and so the slow response, again, um, both with testing for certain, because once we knew that there was pockets along the West Coast, particularly in Washington State and California, they couldn't get tests. Very few people were being tested. Um, the, the nursing homes, as you all probably remember, in Washington State, where they tested a few people, but you had 30, 40 people either living in these nursing homes or working in these nursing homes who clearly were also infected. They couldn't get tests for weeks. It took them two or three weeks to even get tested. Then, then you have to wait for the results. And subsequently, some people also died. So I think I've been really preoccupied with the response, um, slow response, uh, both testing, the, the lack of contact tracing. This country is only starting to contact trace. Um, and even now, that knee really needs to be scaled up. Um, also, I think we had a really good chance in this country early on to contain it in the West Coast, uh, at least that part. I don't think they knew that they had the cases that they had in the East Coast. Um, but if they responded in the West Coast, that would have cut some of the numbers down. And now my new preoccupation is this reopening. Um, as of yesterday, the last state declared they were going to reopen. 
uh, Connecticut, they're reopening to different degrees. And I'm thinking of how can you reopen when you don't have these other things in place and you don't have basic protective gear such as masks available to everyone to wear. Yeah, a lot of those preoccupations resonate, I think, with uh, what people in the UK, where I'm currently situated, are experiencing. And this is the country with the highest death toll in Europe, second highest in the world. Um, it never had a lockdown as draconian as anything that India and South Africa experienced. Um, and yet it's already in the process of opening up. And that opening up has been fiercely contested. We're seeing arguments every day about whether schools are ready to open whether um, anything like normal life is ready to resume. So I think those concerns will resonate in a lot of different places. Already in this conversation, we've started talking about different states. And I have here you know, a really basic question. We, in this conversation about COVID and how the pandemic is progressing, states are measuring themselves against each other. There is some, there's a kind of implicit or explicit comparison going on. How do we know how well a state is doing and I asked that question because I think it was yesterday or day before uh, when Donald Trump was asked about why the U.S. had, you know, whether the, the fact that the U.S. had so many cases uh, was a sign that it was doing the worst. His response was, no, it's a sign that we're doing the most testing, which, of course, we know is not true because on a per capita basis, the U.S. is not testing as much as, say, South Korea. But, you know, these numbers that we keep hearing every day, how do we how do we compare or is, is comparison even important? I'm curious about your thoughts on 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 that. How do we know how well a state is doing? Any anybody? But yeah, I think you might be on mute. Sorry, I thought the question was for Donna, but. Uh... I it's for know. anyone, really, because I think it's a global. Oh, okay. I saw you looking like you were going to speak, so I was waiting. <laughs> so uh, we had, uh, you're right, there's, uh, there, in India we have uh, state governments, and uh, today we had a media briefing. Uh, first of all, India is the only country in the world uh, where neither our prime minister nor our health minister has addressed the media even once. And uh, after a 10-day break, uh, we had a media briefing today and to show that India is doing better, our, uh, the bureaucrats in the health ministry uh, pulled out a graph of the 10 worst performing countries in the world. And they said, you know, India's population is uh, so high and we still have 100,000 cases, uh, which only means we are doing very well. But the truth is, uh, pretty much everything Donna said applies to India. Uh, where we are testing the least per capita, we do not have PPE, we did not stockpile for our healthcare workers. And then there is this uh, layer of uh, uh, six years of having a government which is completely science denialist. Uh, so we had a background, uh, when, the, when the cases started coming, uh, we had the ruling party saying how cow dung and cow urine can help. And then it was homeopathy or Ayurveda. And in the middle of all of this, uh, the numbers that we are getting, uh, in today's press conference, we were told that uh, the recovery rates in India, the mortality rates in India, as well as the testing rates in India, are the best in the world. And uh, uh, I, I don't even know what to say to that, because it's plain as they clear that uh, our hospitals have shut down OPDs and emergency care. And not only are people with coronavirus dying, people without coronavirus, with say tuberculosis or uh, cancer and dialysis, just they, everyone is uh, therapeutically destitute right now in this country. And then there is a humanitarian crisis, which uh, there is no parallel to. Uh, but, then, but then we are dealing with the government. Uh, I personally do not think that um, I personally do not think that uh, this, uh, the numbers that are being shown in public, uh, firstly, are extremely opaque. I don't trust the numbers as a journalist. And secondly, how the numbers are being interpreted uh, is in a very self-serving way. But even with the lockdown, uh, it, the lockdown is not a public health measure. It's a police uh, law and order instrument. And uh, over and over again, we've had epidemics uh, I, I last remember the slums of Monrovia, 
uh, where there were police, uh, uh, it was cordoned off as a, uh, and uh, public health measures do not work, but you bring in police to enforce it. And we are currently stuck in a place where we have a government that does not believe in science. And uh, there is, uh, it's, it's just unfolding how it's unfolding. Uh, so. uh, Phoebe, did you have any, any thoughts on this question of how do we know how well a state is doing? Yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting question, uh, especially because South Africa is getting a lot of praise elsewhere, um, uh, but not so within. Um, uh, um, uh, so when um, the state of disaster was announced and uh, lockdown was um, uh, implemented, what was announced as well was uh, um, a massive screening and testing um, a process that would go alongside um, that. And indeed, now we're sitting at uh, nearly half a million uh, tests conducted in South Africa. And um, uh, according to um, our Department of Health um, stats that come out every evening, um, in the last 24-hour cycle, they were able to test about um, uh, 13,500 um, people. So um, uh, they're priding themselves um, uh, in uh, um, massive testing and screening, and they say, you know, um, the numbers we're seeing at the moment are as a result of that, especially in Cape Town, Cape Town particularly, which is the epicenter of this. Um, uh, they're taking pride in um, uh, a massive screening and testing process that's uh, quite rapid, and that's why um, we're seeing a truer picture um, uh, of the pandemic here. Um, but yeah, along, um, alongside that, uh, what we've seen as well as, um, you know, from within, so that's from the outside, uh, the praise came along. And indeed, when um, the lockdown was first implemented, there was praise from um, within that uh, the president acted decisively and that was the right thing to do, especially uh, because we're seeing, we were seeing then what was coming out of Italy and Spain and, you know, um, uh, the rhetoric was we don't want to. Um, have um, a repetition of Italy or Spain and South Africa. So um, that was a welcome move. But now, um, uh, within um, the discourse within, but now there's um, a lot of questioning whether that hard lockdown was really necessary um, or even relevant for a context uh, um, like South Africa, where I and mean, in um, uh, sort of uh, development times, it's. Uh, um, uh, an emerging economy with high um, uh, levels of inequality and not enough reserves um, uh, in the coffers to cover everybody if you know, such a hard lockdown um, as such that was implemented in China could really work in a context like this. And of course this is where we see um, uh, what falls through in relation to um, uh, those who are on the margins of the economy really are completely falling off, you know, you know, um, domestic workers, cleaners, um, uh, uh, gardeners, um, sex workers, of course, fall within that realm. And um, of course, um, uh, these um, uh, um, are highly gendered and racialized, uh, given uh, the history of South Africa. Um, so, yeah, um, how well is the country doing? Complex. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I think you've helped us unpack some of that complexity. Um, Donna, any thoughts on this comparison, numbers game, data? Um, I'll add a few. Um, I think it's difficult um, to determine, you know, who's doing the best. I mean, definitely if you look at the state level, governments are going to try to spin it to, you know, to look good wherever you are in the world. Um, but I mean, we have examples like New Zealand, which basically I think still has no cases. Okay, that looks really good. I think a lot of the, the, the um, countries in East Asia um, that had some of the earlier cases, a lot of them were able to um, really reduce their numbers really quickly and, and manage it uh, better. We are seeing a resurgence in some of the countries, but overall, the numbers are still fairly low. And once they see the numbers, they're testing very widely to try to, you know, contact trace contain it and not have it um, blow out of control. Um, but I think, you know, really when you're looking at this at the level of a pandemic or an, ep or an epidemic, a lot of states just, just didn't do basic, you know, things that you should do in terms of, you know, really scaling the testing up quickly, 
kind of going back to what I was saying earlier in the contact tracing and these sorts of things. Um, and so I think a lot of them had a lot of problems um, if we look at it like that. So, you know, if we grade them, you definitely see problems throughout a lot of the world. Mm -hmm. So my next question is for anyone who wants to take it really. And this is, again, a sort of comparison question, but it's something that's come up in social media commentary quite a lot. And it's this idea that states that have been led by these toxic masculine figures like Trump and Johnson and Modi, Bolsonaro and Brazil, you know, people who as individuals imagine themselves to be invulnerable and tough, et cetera, et cetera, have also sort of translated that attitude into the way they deal with their own populations. And these figures have tended to be contrasted with more prudent approaches that people like Jacinda Ahern have taken or the health minister in Kerala, Shaila Chah teacher, there's other examples as well. Now, on the one hand, I'm a little bit wary of the gender essentialism in this kind of uh, commentary, but there does seem to be some something to it. So I was curious about how you think about the question of gender leadership style and whether this is a, something relevant to, to consider. Um, this is really a, an open question, so anyone who wants to pick up on this, feel free. I'll go. Yeah, okay. Um, I mean, uh, indeed we have uh, our, our leader is um, uh, one of the very few um, uh, um, uh, billionaires, uh, black billionaires in South Africa. Um, so his interests are aligned um, differently from um, you know, uh, your domestic worker or um, gardener, uh, so to speak. Um, and uh, we saw this um, uh, gendered and class line play out uh, very early on um, uh, in the pandemic when, uh, for instance, um, one thing that has really um, uh, surprised me and have um, really um, uh, uh, yeah, been surprised by is the detail to which um, the regulations uh, put in place um, during the lockdown have um, uh, have been laid out, and uh, indeed, uh, given its um, uh, you know um, male masculinity, it's mostly in these leadership verbals, of course, um, uh, um, ways of life around women and femininity were excluded to begin with. And uh, the example given here is um, uh, um, buying essential goods, it was called when um, uh, the Isha had lockdown um, was put in place, where you could buy certain things and not others. And um, essential goods was groceries, um, foods, um, and medicines, and the like. But what was missing in that was, um, you know, um, uh, um, uh, material for um, uh, women like sanitary towels and uh, diapers and the like. <laughs> These are completely um, uh, left out, excluded from the list in this bizarre detail of what you could buy and not buy them. Uh, and of course, um, uh, this was uh, uh, increasingly revised. Um, and the other thing that wasn't paid that wasn't paid attention to much when um, our lockdown was initially implemented in South Africa was, um, you know, we are, um, uh, uh, um, uh, and this is um, uh, not to reduce it in any shape or form, um, but a society that's crippled with high levels of. Um, uh, domestic violence or interpartner violence and how um, uh, a hard lockdown like this um, uh, could impact uh, um, or escalate uh, situations in relation to this. These were not thought through at all um, uh, in the beginning and, and the government has had to um, uh, um, sit down and think through it um, uh, after, of course, um, it was put on the plate. Uh, so these are the gender dynamics mm. that have played out in the context. I, I wanted to, if I could just follow up on that, ask you, what what does how does what does social distancing mean from the perspective of a sex worker? What happens to life and work in that kind of situation? 
Um, so what happened, uh, so like I said, we're mostly working with street-based sex workers and um, uh, most of um, having painted a picture of South Africa being an equal, you know, having gone through um, uh, 400 years of colonialism, which is still very much present in that, you know, um, uh, the economy and um, land and um, uh, modes of sustenance are in a very few minority. Um, population. So our sex workers who are street based um, are homeless. Many of them are homeless. Uh, and so what happened uh, with the implementation of uh, the hard lockdown was um, housing of homeless people in uh, makeshift camps. So big tents were set up in designated areas and all homeless people were collected and put uh, in these spaces. But these spaces were um, you know, extremely um, uh, poor in um, setup and uh, completely, um, uh, some actually refer to them as being, um, uh, you know, equal to uh, camps, um, uh, um, you know, um, yeah, the latter camps. So uh, the modes of uh, survival and living were extremely um, uh, uh, impossible. So social distancing <laughs> uh, was impossible uh, in those spaces. Um, but not only that, um, so um, in townships, uh, which are geographical locations that are remnants of apartheid, where um, uh, uh, modes of accommodation are in the form of, you know, a shack and um, nine people living in, uh, you know, a one room. It's social distancing was impossible there as well. So, um, and currently the um, spikes of clusters of infection that we're observing are in these spaces um, in the township, I think, um, Mitchell's Plain or Kailicha and Cape Town, which are some of the biggest townships, that's where um, uh, uh, the spike of numbers is, and um, it's been clusters to households. Um, uh, in one of them, supermarkets and uh, other spaces where uh, uh, crowds are. Uh, so social distancing is close to impossible in these spaces. Mm. A lot of what you're saying resonates quite a lot with the stories coming out of India, particularly around migrant labor. Uh, Vidya, you were talking about the pictures of migrant labor reminding us of almost partition-like in their scale, in the scale of movement that's happening at the moment. Um, I, I wonder if you could maybe speak to that. Uh, it seems to me that it's highlighting issues that we've always already had, homelessness, precariousness. Um, and so this is just making it more visible, more obvious. Yeah. Uh, um, when, the, when the lockdown was in force on the 24th, we got a four hour notice. And almost immediately, the journalists knew that they, this is going to be trouble. But uh, we definitely did not see the scale of there are 100 million uh, migrants on the streets of India 56 days after the lockdown. And we have uh, oh, progressively, again, you cannot, uh, with this government, you can't isolate uh, just the pandemic from its other agenda, which has been to uh, which, which is all kinds of minorities, but in this case, Muslim minorities uh, have been blamed for spreading the pandemic. And then came uh, that then came this uh, wave of uh, a series of anti poor decisions. And uh, frankly, politically speaking, uh, Modi has emerged. Uh, he, he calls himself a chai wala. He calls himself uh, a son of the soil. And uh, he has consistently taken these decisions. In fact, I was reading an edit piece today saying how, despite all of this, his popularity is soaring in India. And there are people who say that even today, if he uh, contested an election, he would he would win. And um, is that because people are grateful for the protection of a strong man in a situation like this, and so they just need somebody, anybody? Or what's the logic of that? Uh, frankly, I uh, frankly I can't make sense of that logic because the people I go out to report and people are angry. They don't have food to eat. Every day we have been waking up to migrants dying, and uh, India has uh, en masse just kind of done away with labor laws. 
because uh, and now we are thinking about easing restrictions but then the labor movement started from the big cities and they wanted to get to their villages but midway through uh, our uh, corporate india our businessmen realized that if these laborers laborers get back to their villages they cannot open their factories so wherever they were they were just uh, they uh, blocked the state borders and they set the police on them and they did not give them transport so uh, uh, as to what you were saying is that a lot of uh, while while south africa keeps repeatedly getting the uh, uh, shame for the apartheid years and it keeps bringing that in the conversation of how they have arrived at this moment in history india has never reconciled with its history of uh, very insidious casteism uh, and patriarchy uh the, 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 then there is in islamophobia and uh, the pandemic has basically seen all of it a mal and uh, there is no hiding i feel like a lot of decent people who are now out on the streets helping uh feel that there's no hiding away from how uh how ugly um, i was reading arundhati roy's column where she was saying that india has revealed herself uh, in all her ugliness and i i agree because uh, the pandemic also comes to india uh, in a genocidal atmosphere and then uh, there are there is a uh, uh, this is class warfare what's happening in india there is no other way to sum it up but to call it class warfare because the poor have no way to go they have no food they have no shelter the government has not given them a stimulus uh, uh, there has not been a financial package there has not even been transport arrangements uh we are we are not counting the deaths that we are seeing and uh, for all the questions that you asked be it about gender or be it about whether it's stemming from toxic masculinity or whether some states are doing better i kind of keep coming back to this thing that i feel we are in the fog of war and whatever we can make sense of uh maybe from a year from now we will be able to make sense of what we lived through because at this point in india i'm not even able to go out and report properly all i am all i'm believing is people i can reach out uh, on the phone or just in driving distance i cannot uh, i've never reported like this on a story before where you're just uh, locked inside state borders so we are all uh, i for sure i'm talking on the on on the basis of the best information available to me but even the best information available to me is just in, uh, not reliable at this point so i want to come back to that phrase you used fog of war i think it's something that could be important for us to think about um donna in the us and uk obviously we're living under these white supremacist regimes and it's quite striking in light of that also to think about how black and ethnic minority people have been affected by covid and the distressingly high rates of deaths that have been reported in in black and ethnic minority communities in both the US and the UK can you help us make sense of that um yes i've been following the numbers closer in the in the US in this respect um but i do have some kind of broad i guess ideas about it um definitely in the US we're seeing this we're seeing this we saw this in new orleans we're seeing this in detroit um St. Louis different parts of the country even if you look at the numbers in New York most of the people who died from covid were black and brown people um and you know the infection rates you did have white people die you did have them get infected um but what we're seeing both there and in other in other parts of the country is that um black and brown people tend to be dying more um and in the UK I know definitely in terms of healthcare workers because I followed this a bit that a lot of the the healthcare workers of color are tending to die you know at a higher number per capita uh than white healthcare workers are um in the UK and I think definitely in the US and I and I think this could be some of this you could probably find in the UK to some degree too um when you look at life expectancy in the US um I'm just going to look black and white right now if you look everything all things being equal someone with the same level of education someone with the same economic strata everything black people tend to die much earlier than white people um so they could be you know medical doctors but just the average they're going to die maybe 10 years 10 15 years before just because they're black and so a lot of that is stress what's how stress manifests in the body just being a black person 
or even a brown person navigating living in the US. And I think you can probably see some of this in the UK too. Um, but definitely there have been a lot of studies in the US and they show this. They look at, for instance, someone who maybe has migrated, let's say from Nigeria, for instance. Um, and a first generation person will have health outcomes similar to where they come from, uh, from whatever country they come from. But someone who's second generation will already have health outcomes that look like African-Americans, that look like people who have been living here for generations. Um, so I think that definitely is part of it. But you also have other things. You also have issues in terms of health access. Where do you live? What is your zip code? Do you have a good hospital? Uh, is that hospital uh, over capacity, for instance? Um, so I think there are a number of variables to think about when we're thinking about this. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, there's a lot of echo, I hope you can hear me. All of you have studied other epidemics and pandemics and other diseases for that matter, whether it's tuberculosis or HIV AIDS or Ebola or Zika. And one of the things I'm wondering in light of that is how does this compare? And have those previous experiences taught us anything, any lessons that have been useful? Have they left behind any legacies that maybe this pandemic has had to pick up on. Um, what are your thoughts on comparisons between diseases? And again, this is an open question for anyone who wants to pick up on so, it. Um, I, just, I just finished writing uh, a book on uh, India as the epicenter of the drug resistance, drug resistance strains of uh, tuberculosis infections. And uh, while I was researching that, I was uh, reading a lot of plague literature uh, over the last couple of years, in fact. And uh, uh, to answer your question, uh, there are uh, there are just so many lessons, especially uh, throughout medical history, uh, uh, as as way back as the Justinian Empire, you have examples where. The traders uh, who were uh, taking ships and coming to the cities were being blamed because they were richer and happened to be Jews. And uh, public health uh, is always so closely tied with uh, outcomes that are political, especially in cases where there have been genocides. There's this, uh, I covered the Rohingya genocide uh, two years ago, three years ago now. And uh, before the genocide happened, and I spoke from the Indian context, we saw a pogrom in, in February. And uh, there is such a close uh, relationship with public health where you name, uh, blame the community for being unhygienic. We have our home minister who's calling the Bangladeshis, especially Bengali speaking Muslims, uh, termites. And the, all of this was already happening before coronavirus came into India. And over and over again, what pandemics uh, have shown in history is whenever there is a new pathogen, uh, the majority community creates uh, to create some distance of safety that they want to perceive that this is happening to those people. They either say they are dirty or they are outsiders. During the HIV community, it was the homosexual community who were uh, more at risk and what then happens is the full force of the uh, biases of the mainstream community is brought to bear upon the worst affected communities. Uh, during the HIV epidemic, uh, not only was the homosexual community affected very badly, they needed more budgets for uh, research and development, but then you had homophobic government almost in every part of the world. And whereas in the first world, uh, there were people like Larry Kramer, there were issues like ACT UP that, that did, uh, institutions eventually did kick in. Um, but then in Asian and African nations, it took longer, it was slower. Uh, and I feel like at least in countries like India, in low resource settings where populations uh, are not entitlement literate, uh, we have not learned any of those lessons. And uh, by the time this pandemic is over, I, I actually worry about a lot of collateral damage that the minorities in India, which could be sexual minorities or religious minorities or just social minorities, Dalits and uh, caste minorities, uh, it's, it's going to be, uh, the toll is already heavy. We are already, uh, the, oh, 
I, 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 I frankly uh, try to make sense of it. And again, I keep coming back that we are just three months into this. Um, and we are still bracing for impact in India. Um, and our lockdowns are going to be lifted. So uh, I worry about uh, everything that you're raising. And there are no there are no answers at this point that I, I have. I wish we looked at history more. But then again, we have a government which is just anti-intellectual in every way. So there is that. Yeah, um, and that is, sorry, very sobering because the, the Indian toll in 100 years ago in the in the Spanish flu, so-called Spanish flu pandemic yes. was incredibly high. So it was the highest. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Donna, sorry, you want to um, Yes. Um, so yeah, definitely, if you think about the, the 1918 flu pandemic, I mean, it went all over the world. I mean, uh, Philadelphia, which is close to me, you know, had also had some high rates. They had this big parade, you know, in the middle of the pandemic. And so all of these people were infected. Um, but I was thinking more about Ebola and thinking about the 2014, 2016 Ebola um, epidemic uh, and a lot of the lessons that that came out of there. Um, so some of the lessons were, you know, very quick response, needing fast response, needing um, large scale um, coordination. Um, and you know coordination of stuff, coordination of um, of um, healthcare, but also coordinating different medical professionals and this sort of thing. Um, but also, um, in terms of that, um, you know, just kind of getting back to the basic pieces of epidemiology. You know, the contact tracing, um, you know, containing disease, um, and these sorts of things. And so we learned a lot of that, or at least I thought we learned a lot of that in the world. For instance, the U.S. government started a whole pandemic um, office at the White House after that. So that was then Obama's administration. In 2017, soon after Trump becomes president, he dismantles this particular office. Um, so kind of moving back. And I know Vidya talked about this a little bit earlier, kind of this idea of anti-science. And I think that's what we're seeing in, you know, in some of these states that have been slower uh, in responding. And we can think of a lot of them in different parts of the world, but we've definitely been seeing some of that here. So what does that look like? You know, should you do these things? I mean, the US, one of the reasons that the testing was so slow was because that they had, they created their own tests. They didn't want to create, use the WHO's test, so CDC, created a test that had some problems and then it had to go through approvals from the FDA and others. And so, so one of the reasons it took so long to roll out was that. Um, but going back um, to Ebola, um, I'm also thinking about what is happening now um, in two countries that had some instances of Ebola, but not tons. Senegal that had one case in 2014 and Nigeria that ended up having 20 cases in 2014. And in those cases, um, because you know, the three hardest hit had been Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone. And so they were after the fact. And so they had more time to prepare and they used their time very well. Um, so Senegal had one case, it was someone who had migrated from Guinea. Uh, and in Nigeria, they also had one initial case, someone who had come from Liberia. Now it did spread more, particularly since he purposely infected some medical professionals who were trying to treat him and also keep him in the hospital. Um, but again, 20 in the whole country, which was amazing. He was in Lagos, which has a population of about 20 million people. So imagine, it wouldn't take much for that to really blow up in the country. Also, when this was happening in Nigeria, the public doctors were on strike. So I was looking and I was thinking, oh my God, this is gonna be a nightmare, but they still handled it very well. And one of the reasons they handled it well, because they were really good with contact tracing. They really traced, they traced very quickly. They checked in on everybody that they were looking at every day, you know, to see if they exhibited symptoms, should they go to the hospital, should they be quarantined and these sorts of things. So they did that every day. In fact, one nurse actually escaped uh, who was on quarantine in Nigeria. She left the hospital. She went to a village where she had family. They went, they took an ambulance and they picked her up and then brought her back to Lagos. So they were very quick. Senegal, the same thing. So you had the one person, Senegal ends up uh, contact tracing, I think they were looking at 74 people um, by the end. They did not only check on those people once a day, they checked on them twice a day, you know, because they'd seen what happened in Nigeria and they were like, we want to really make sure no one's moving. Um, that one person, like I said, was infected. They sent him back to Guinea. Um, the then Minister of Health, she made a statement saying, you know, we've taken care of him, but don't think that you can come here to get treatment. You should get treated in your own country. And that was their only case. Now, now with COVID, Senegal, definitely the numbers are much higher than one. 
um, but they've been responding fairly well. And you may have seen some press on Senegal. Uh, they're developing a rapid test. Testing is widespread. PPE is fairly widely available. Um, and so the, these sorts of things are happening. Um, also, the, the president made some very quick measures in terms of you know, closing schools, closing um, certain stores, but even mosques and other uh, religious um, institutions, which was a really major deal in Senegal, given the power um, of, of Islam in the country. It's a predominantly Muslim country, about 93, 94% in the power of those religious leaders. Now they're they're kind of gradually reopening the mosque. They just started in the past week with social distancing, but this was a major. Now Nigeria is not faring as well. Officially, uh, the numbers look better than they appear to be, but there there's definitely some bit of uh, undercounting that's happening because the numbers of people dying, the funerals, the morgues, and these sorts of things. So the reporting that you're getting there, you know that the numbers, again, are much higher than the official numbers. Thank you. Uh, Phoebe, I was thinking about South Africa's previous, well, ongoing experience with HIV AIDS and whether that has any parallels with the present moment. Indeed, I mean, uh, South Africa will go down in the history books as so being slow to react to HIV and AIDS. In fact, um, uh, that's uh, uh, one of the things that goes on the big legacy who had valid questions around um, uh, the correlation between poverty and HIV, but didn't, you know, um, act concurrently uh, in uh, implementing treatment uh, programs alongside those questions. Um, so I guess it's lessons learned from that with the swift act um, in relation to um, uh, the COVID now uh, with, um, uh, you know, our implementation of mass testing, screening and contact, test, um, contact tracing, uh, with pouring in of resources, um, both um, within the health um, uh, domain as well as uh, socially um, uh, to address um, uh, uh, the pandemic, as well as um, uh, the one thing I'm noticing a lot is information, public information around the virus, where there's a lot everywhere, you know, radio, television, and posters, um, a lot of information on uh, what the virus is and what it should do, uh, which wasn't the case uh, with HIV, of course, and um, uh, uh, with that mis uh, misinformation or disinformation came misconception, which uh, led to a lot of stigma around HIV. Um, and indeed, um, Corona or the COVID had uh, picked up a bit of stigma around here, but I see um, or hear a lot of information again um, um, in the public public realm and narrative to decipher that um, the stigma around COVID. So, uh, indeed, it's lessons learned. Um, knowing that marginal communities would be hit the most, um, as in the case of HIV. We're sitting at 7 million, um, nearly 8 million um, and, you know, uh, people living with HIV in South Africa now. Um, South Africa was the epicenter, so there's a point. point. Uh, so um, I think it's lessons learned from that that have um, uh, um, facilitated uh, the quick response to um, the COVID. Mm. Thank you. Um, I want to open the discussion now to the audience. Um, and just to remind you, the way to do this, so we'll do it, we'll do it verbally, because it, I think it would be nice to actually hear our audience voices. So the way to do this is to use the icons at the bottom of your screen. Uh, if you just click the raise hand icon, then I will see that you want to ask a question, and I will call you by name, uh, and then our moderator will enable your uh, audio. So maybe while people are thinking about questions, I would just put a last uh, question for this round to really to Phoebe and Donna. I was quite struck by Vidya's phrase about the fall of war, uh, the kind of confusion that we're all in. And I, I'm curious, how do we as researchers and writers and people trying to do interventions of various kinds, how do we do that in a situation like this where we're all stuck in our houses and we're relying on information, the credibility of which, you know, is not always um, certain. What do you see as the potential for knowledge production or intervention in this kind of situation? I think it's challenging for certain. Um, there is uh, the fog of sense. Um, it could be a war. It could just be living through a pandemic. 
I mean, frankly, um, I think there's fog that comes with that, the trauma that comes with it, the trauma that people that don't even think that they know that they're experiencing. What is this going to look like? You know, what are people going to see five, 10 years from now in terms of that? Um, so definitely in terms of producing, it's, it's challenging. And I think in terms of what, what video was saying in terms of just gathering research, you know, because I write on epidemics and global health and how do you get research? You know, you can call and then, you know, I'm keeping you know, these bit of archives, but it is different than being able to go to a place. Um, because even, you know, for instance, if you're looking at a yellow fever outbreak or a Zika outbreak or Ebola, it's usually, um, even if it's beyond one country, it's usually fairly contained to a number of countries at most. And so you can travel, or you can go in or you can come back out, but this is basically has encompassed the entire world. Um, and so you can't really escape it, um, even if you'd like to. Um, so that's definitely challenging. Um, and also, um, and just in terms of being a professor and researcher, I'm chair of my department right now, which means that I work full time. Uh, I don't have summers off, uh, at least where I work. And so what does that look like as I'm thinking about what can I do this summer in terms of writing some things? I was able to get one short article off that's um, under review now, but it was really hard to write it, both in terms of the time with my full time job, but also being able to focus. I think it is difficult to be able to produce in the ways that we might have been able to produce, at least a lot of people. At least I know I'm experiencing it. Not everybody experiences it. But you know, six months ago, it felt very different than it feels now. CB, did you have any thoughts on these of being a researcher, writer in this moment? Indeed, indeed very much preoccupied by that as well. Me, myself, as a researcher, but also um, uh, teaching a research course <laughs> uh, with students who are um, uh, caught up uh, in this as well. I, um, I'm, I'm anxious about uh, uh, writing their thesis or doing research in relation to their thesis um, and in this time. Um, some having to uh, change direction in terms of research question altogether. Um, but uh, in relation to my own research, uh, research um, I mean, I'm not uh, a theatre performance um, a scholar or expert, but um, uh, the kind of work I'm doing is intersectional and completely intertwined in that. And this is a field um, where um, the approach, work, and medium uh, of engagement is highly embodied, highly embodied, and it's face to face. And um, uh, my colleague Sarah Machet, um, uh, who I work with, um, this is going through what I would refer to um, as existential crisis in relation to reimagining this whole discipline in this pandemic. I mean, um, a theatre and performance um, has various facets to it um, uh, that I embodied, but now um, the only um, medium possible at the moment is monologues or spoken word or, you know, um, uh, engaging uh, with film, something like that, which is, uh, you know, like a small sliver of uh, the whole discipline. So the whole discipline is going through uh, a reimagination of, um, you know, this embodied knowledge um, uh, that has been produced for years, how this could um, so even possible to transfer this online or uh, in a virtual medium or space. Uh, so this is what we're grappling with at the moment and uh, with a specific research project where uh, we work with a group of sex workers and train them in um, theatre performance um, uh, aspects uh, with the idea of at the end of the project they would have their own independent theatre company, a sex worker theatre company where they could you know, continue on the work themselves. Um, uh, and the current module we were working with, luckily, which is um, spoken word uh, song, um, can in a way be translated into a virtual medium, which is what we're doing, but there's a lot lost in translation. Uh, um, uh, so this is uh, what we're grappling with, how, I mean, we're, tra we're traversing new terrains altogether, and um, uh, uh, we'll see how it pans out as we go along. Yeah, I can imagine it must take so much thinking and creativity to transform, as you say, embodied and collective production in, in the circumstances of this disembodied and individualized life that we're all, you know, trying to um, live. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for audience 
members to raise their hands, but maybe just while you think of your question, maybe I can sneak in one more. Vidya, I remember reading an interview you gave to, um, I can't remember which news outlet it was, but it was about the sheer harassment that you were encountering as you were reporting this story. Uh, and I wonder yeah. if you could maybe tell us a bit about what's happening, why you think it's happening, and how you're dealing with it. So, uh, anyone who's reporting on the pandemic, uh, again, uh, it, with this government, uh, never in the history of independent India have we had a government this petty and this vindictive. But uh, that's where we are now, and we, uh, we've never had such kind of division within journalists. So, there is a right wing which is well funded. And uh, uh, I'm a freelance journalist, and then on top of that, I'm a woman, and um, on top of that, I'm opinionated. So all of these are things that uh, do not work well with the current administration. So uh, when you challenge the government, uh, which my reporting has repeatedly done, uh, and the biggest problem they have is I write for international outlets, if I write for the Atlantic or the LA Times, it's seen as you're a traitor because you go abroad and you complain about India. So there have been death threats and there has there have been threats of rape and uh, we uh, female journalists have been living with those kind of things in India for a while. But I, I uh, like I say, every day is overwhelming and nothing in my almost 20 years of reporting career has prepared me for for the kind of um, just every day is overwhelming. Uh, I got in touch with Reporters Without Borders. They're based in Paris, and uh, they were like, we can help you relocate, or we can send you security systems. And I was like, you don't understand the context. Uh, we are in the kind of lockdown that there is no, there is nothing possible. And uh, this year, we've had uh, at least seven of my colleague, colleagues, my beach colleagues, are in jail. Three of them are uh, facing police harassment. Uh, and we are, we have to continue reporting in this circumstance because uh, uh, we we are in a social. I really hope a few years from now, when the dust settles, uh, that there, there there are a bunch of people who will leave a record of what happened uh, closer to the context for when there are researchers who pick up and want to get a version of what the migrants were going through, which is not just the government's. Uh, a point of view, and that's what we are trying to do. And I feel like uh, that's what I should focus on because the minute you get involved in how much abuse you're getting, uh, that's a downward spiral, and it, it's already so stressful to uh, produce written work at this point of time. And just focusing on uh, the harassment, uh, I've, I have had to hire a law lawyer now. I've never had to do that, but now that's. Uh, but that's that's the new normal of our reporting. So I guess wow. that's the job. That's really sobering. Um, there are some comments here. Yeah. Okay. So let's let me maybe. Wow. These are long comments. Uh, <laughs> It's a bit difficult to. Can I encourage participants to raise your question verbally because that will allow you to maybe um, enter into the conversation as a as a participant. So, uh, Ray Jiang, if you'd like to raise your question, please go ahead. If you're still online. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead if you can. Aki, could you enable uh, audio for Ray Jiang, please? Yeah, oh, hi, Ray. Hello. Hi. Hi. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you so much for these panel talks, and these are really inspiring me. Um, I'm I'm South Korean and I'm living in um, Ann Arbor, Michigan. I'm studying here and um, I'm researching about the inequality and uh, social injustice in America. And um, after having the pandemic, I've been really 
Whitney is saying about like people stare at me in a weird way um, because I'm I'm Asian, and even though I'm having a lot of conversations and um, this kind of talks with my cohort, um, what is the mean? What is the meaning of the having some allies over to overcome this kind of pandemic? But still, we have a lot of um, we we are revealing a lot of social injustice and the people like they're showing unshamedly, unshamedly um, the ha the hatred and horror towards Asian. And I'm really wondering how have you ever changed your perspectives or some kind of like um, I don't know like. Um, perspective towards Asian and how do you see how can we overcome this kind of um, yeah social injustice thank you thank you thanks so I guess the question and this is to any of the panelists uh, maybe I also it's, it's one about what are the possibilities for resistance and solidarity in a time where people are facing discrimination in the context of uh, the situation we're in. Anyone who wants to take a go. Well, I'll jump in because <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know if I have any really clear uh, thought ideas about it. I think it's going to be challenging in the midst of a pandemic, but I think there are ways to do this, you know, kind of uh, through the internet, uh, creating maybe forums, uh, social media, creating groups uh, to talk about these things. I think some of the um, issues that she raised, we're definitely seeing now uh, in the U.S. I know that there have been some instances of this in other parts of the country. Uh, and I think in the U.S. it's kind of more complicated, particularly since you see it a lot too at kind of the highest level of governments, uh, some of the rhetoric, rhetoric that is coming out. And I think that makes it even more troubling in some ways versus just kind of, you know, everyday um, interactions. And I think that's helping to reduce, reproduce what people are thinking, some people are thinking and how they're responding. Because I know early on when I first started doing um, a lot of interviews about this, I'd say, um, sometime probably in late February, this was one of the main issues that came up. People would ask me questions like, you know, is it a Chinese disease? And I remember being on one radio station uh, and basically pushing back um, on the anchor saying, you know, the disease from what we know, because we don't know everything, because it was still very early, you know, it, it's, it appears that started in China, but it's not a Chinese disease. And so, you know, because he was talking about travel bans and Chinese people spreading it. And I said, you know, if there's an American businessman, and I was implying a white American businessman in our conversation, if he's in China and he comes back and he has been infected, you know, with COVID-19, I don't even know if they had, if it was called COVID-19 yet or not, I can't remember. I think by this time it was, I can't remember the, the trajectory of the naming of it. Um, but, you know, that he could still, you know, then infect someone else. So this idea that it can, you know, it doesn't need, it could, anyone can be a host effectively. It's not race based. Um, and, you know, so I talked about other types of diseases and how anybody can have them. So a lot of this was kind of just basic educating and kind of pushing against stereotypes. So I guess that's one way of solidarity. Um, but I think, you know, people need to educate themselves and also just being open, open to, you know, different possibilities. And I mean, I see there's a lot that we see that um, definitely is, um, Somewhat troubling. Yeah. Um, anyone else? Feel free to jump in. But uh, um, there are I would just uh, like to tell uh, how I'm really sorry that this is happening and she gets stared at, uh, and that's that's not okay. But in India, COVID, coronavirus is a Muslim. Muslims are being blamed for it. So the issue is not the disease here. The issue is how people uh, react to threats and how people react to things they don't understand and they always react to that with fear uh, and uh, that cannot define um, unfortunately uh, the people who are in power who should not stigmatize communities and we've seen this over and over again public health is filled with examples of how that does not help it's not an effective measure 
and it's not a kind it's not a kind way to live um but then i i was sorry this is the world we live in uh, at this point and uh, there the i feel like a, there is there is so there are so many people who are introspecting at this point there is so much good work that's also being done and um, i uh, there are again there are no easy solutions to any of this i have not faced uh, um, i'm not muslim so i'm not faced that in india but then we all have to be strong at this point for very many reasons and we cannot let what someone else uh, the hate that you see in someone else's eyes for you cannot be the one that defines you at this point mm-hmm. exactly uh phoebe because i can't see you just jump in whenever you want to answer a question okay okay thank yeah. you yeah yeah um there was a question from shreya banerjee whose microphone is not working so i'm going to read it out um it's and uh, shreya asks given where the speakers are in the world what are your thoughts or visions on transitioning and recovering from the pandemic and all the wide scale issues and inequalities that you spoke about so i guess it's a question about what does an exit from this situation look like um what kinds of practical changes and ideological progress are needed given the lessons learned from this crisis how does the pandemic end <laughs> slowly <laughs> um donna i think the professor should take this one i should take this one how does it end um i think we all laughed um i mean it's difficult to say and i think it's going to end in stages frankly um because of you know the way it impacted different countries differently and in some countries it's really only starting now um in some parts of this country is only starting now so what is you know what does that look like when does it end i mean what we saw in china very early on um china really was able to um really contain it in about 2 months which i thought was amazing given the numbers that we saw coming out of the hubei province and the, you know wuhan and the hubei province and all of this and i mean look at how china protected its big cities you know beijing and shanghai I mean they had very very low numbers. Um I I looked at them I can't I I'm not going to quote them right now but very very low. I mean no more than a few hundred at if that. Um so imagine that in having cities that size. Now what China is seeing now is that most of their cases are coming from people flying in from other countries now bringing it you know to China. Um and so that's what they're seeing now. Um but they're responding very swiftly in terms of testing, contact tracing and trying not to have it explode. Um and so, you know, that's a, that looks good, I guess. Um but, you know, I mean, it's hard to answer because I think what we're I think because it's so widespread, um there's very likely that it's going to be very difficult for it to fully end without a vaccine and widespread use of the vaccine. Because one of the things I've been saying is everyone's not going to take a vaccine. So what is that going to look like? Um so I think maybe getting to the certain point where you have low transmission rates uh lower death rates but also really having supplies in in place both having healthcare facilities in in place and this is something that I teach about and something that I've been screaming about for years you know in terms of global health security and you know states not being prepared not putting the money and um you know into these these facilities and, and we really see that so both facilities but also now what we're seeing probably even more to some degree more than facilities is protective gear even masks You know, in a lot of states in the US right now, you're supposed to wear a mask if you go out. Mask it's very difficult to buy a mask if you want to wear a mask because I also have to say everybody does not want to wear them or wear them even though they're supposed to even though it's been mandated. But it's difficult to buy a mask. And if you can buy a mask, it's probably a surgical mask. Um and a surgical mask is not going to protect the wearer per se. There's a little protection, but the protection is much lower than an N95 or KN95 or PPP. a ppf2 or something like this. And so what does that look like? So I think um having those more of those things available um to help maybe stem it. Also in terms of the US, I think it's been so pervasive in terms of the spread throughout the country. Um and it's still spreading out in new parts of the country. Um I think we're going to be not only are we the epicenter, I guess, you know, uh, closely followed by um UK and um 
Brazil now, I think, is number three yeah. in terms of the numbers yeah. in the world. And I mean, we've all just well eclipsed, you know, China at this point. I mean, the U.S., I don't even know what the numbers are now, but over a million and a half people have been infected. Um, and I think it was, was it 80 something the last time I looked in terms of the number of people who had died? Because the numbers shift so, so quickly that I can't even keep up with them anymore. But it's been so pervasive in this country that there's no way I don't think um, that it's going to end in this country without a vaccine and widespread use of the vaccine. And I think the other impact of that is what does that look like globally? Europe, while some countries have high numbers, a lot of those with higher numbers, you can see that, you know, they're kind of, they're trending downward. Um, and so I think they've responded better. They have protected, protective gears more available in most places. I know you can buy a mask in France at a pharmacy at most of the grocery store chains, just everywhere. Where here you can't even find them. You haven't been able to find them in months. And if they put, if they stock them, they're basically going to sell out in a few hours. Um, and so that's very, that's going to be challenging. So the U.S. now, um, after kind of trying to keep everybody out in the beginning, you know, stopping flights from China, doing the ban for, for people from Europe and this sort of thing, it's probably going to be one of the places that's going to start spreading it back out into the world. Um, and so I think, I can't imagine the end right now, that's what I'll say. Uh, but I think it's going to take probably two or three years before we see something that is seemingly an end. I don't know if that helped or not, but that's kind of what I'm pondering. Yeah. And I think, yeah, go ahead, Phoebe. I think the uh, economic consequences will be last for a very long time. The economy mm -hmm. will come up to the mm -hmm. We're going to see for years to come. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, there was a question from Kate Makonen. Please go ahead and ask your question. Aki, if you could uh, enable audio, please. Uh, yeah, okay, please click on the microphone button towards the uh, bottom of your screen. Kayat, you need to enable your audio. So if you just look at the icons at the bottom of your screen, just make sure your audio is working. Um, anybody else in the meanwhile who, okay, yeah, I see you as a, yeah, you want to go ahead and ask your question, please. Okay, while we figure that out, if anybody else has a question, do feel free to raise your hand. No, Kaya, can you, can you, yeah, can you ask a question now? Is your audio enabled? Uh, Valentina. Hi, can you guys hear me? Yes. Great, thank you. This has been um, really good. Um, perhaps a question to the panel about how they think we can sort of build that herd immunity without losing, you know, individual privacy rights and the sort of issues that have been emerging around contact tracing and the role of sort of big tech within those. Um, is there anyone who wanted to sort of comment on that? Yeah, it's a great Thank question. You. So, any thoughts on contact tracing apps, technology? So uh, I think. Uh, I think that one because uh, I'll start with that. India has a contact tracing app, which is extremely uh, intrusive. It uses geolocation, and again, this government has used geolocation to go after most of minority neighborhoods. So everyone is nervous. Um, my my uh, the minute everyone uh, talks about herd immunity, the first cons question I have in my mind. Uh, is what's implicit in that. When you say you want herd immunity, what is implicit into that question is that you're willing to say that if you are, if there are 100 people and for you to reach herd immunity, say 95 people uh, have to be exposed to something, 
are you as a society willing to accept collateral damage which would be many people who will just die because we want to we are impatient and we want to end this quickly so anyone who has a commodity or anyone who is poor or anyone or for a variety of reasons uh, is not at the best of his health or her health uh, i feel like countries civilized nations cannot look at herd immunity as a solution just as now uh, we uh, as a society we dealt with polio vaccines and we've had many uh, instances in fact uh, the bizarrest thing i was reading today from the us is uh the anti vaccine movement is actually uh, gaining momentum in the middle of all of this so uh, even what are we talking about when you say herd immunity is that question just stemming from we can't sit at home anymore and this new normal doesn't work for us and so it's okay that the uh, x amount of people just have to be sacrificed and uh, Again, there are no clear answers, but then the minute you begin uh, to engage with herd immunity, it already looks like a very uh, kind way uh, to look at a solution for a problem that's affecting the entire world right now. Mhm, mm mhm. I agree with you absolutely on the herd immunity. Um, I, I want to say one thing because I've been talking about contact tracing. I'm talking about old fashioned contact tracing where you have people who go and check on people who, you know, maybe someone got sick. So not apps and they're not using apps. I don't know of, at least in this country, even though there is talk of other surveillance. Um, definitely. We saw a lot of surveillance um, in China um, and not only with that, but with the lockdown. I, I don't know if you all saw this, but even in some of the apartment buildings, they had cameras. So if you're going to leave the building, they would know who was even leaving and entering the building, you know, as a part of the lockdown. So very kind of strict surveillance. Uh, TB, did you want to come in on that, or should I take another question? Um, well, in terms of uh, perhaps not, um, uh, in terms of surveillance, uh, we're increasingly seeing that in South Africa. I mean, uh, when um, the state of national disaster was declared, um, uh, an army was deployed alongside that um, uh, to, to um, enforce. And um, uh, during the hard lockdown, um, uh, uh, in the beginning days, uh, there was a lot of um, uh, um, incidences of um, brutality from the military um, in relation to enforcing that, as well as security forces. Um, and now, in um, level four lockdown, uh, we have a curfew uh, between uh, 8 p.m. and um, uh, 8, uh, no, at 6 a.m. in the morning. And uh, anyone who sh um, uh, is entitled to work, as in is an essential worker during uh, uh, the lockdown, uh, needs a permit um, uh, to move, and one can be stopped and asked for that permit um, uh, by roadblocks, uh, which are set up um, uh, along uh, metropoles um, uh, around the country. So um, this mode of surveillance um, has really been uh, enforced uh, in a draconian way that we're ensuring um, adherence. Um, so indeed, um, that's a cause for concern and worry, um, especially um, uh, with um, metropoles like Cape Town who are taking advantage of um, this pandemic and passing laws within uh, Parliament that um, uh, aggravate such um, you know, being stopped and searched without any warrant. Um, uh, so um, it is a cause for concern um, in terms of governmentality that way uh, as a result of the pandemic. Thank you. Um, Kate, do you want to get your question in now? I see your hand is still up, so hopefully, yeah, go ahead. I have this problem. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, my concern is, uh, since the lockdown or since the uh, coronavirus uh, uh, problem started in China, I mean, <clears throat> there has been thousands and thousands of discussions between scientists, government, 
uh, activists and journalists, you name it, uh, with every uh, professional group. I find that in most cases, in most problems, uh, we were never, um, we never try to involve the people who are the victims of every conflict and every um, illnesses or an epidemic. You know, it's the people what matters. It's not, you know, discussing amongst professionals or journalists. It seems like, you know, uh, the last since 1900, the same discussion, the same uh, group of people, you know, at different age, at different stages, would be discussing about the problem of the mass. Where are the people coming? And this uh, virus also is not something uh, ordinary, you know, globally, the whole life has been shut down to the extent, you know, where we had no say and we just had to obey. So the discussion is not should should not be about finding vaccine. Even if you find vaccine, how many people are are you going to save? The poor will always die. The poor will always starve. The poor will always be out of the agenda, out of any kind of discussion. So really, what I'm asking is everyone who've had the privilege and also the, the uh, fortune of having good education, good life, they should start, you know, discussing about the people to involve the mass. Because now the only, the only way we can win, uh, it's not because of vaccine, it's not because of lockdown, it is once the people rise up and stop government scientists playing around with people's like professionals, media, all these uh, privileged people. We need to get a discussion about the ordinary people, which is Thank the you. majority. In I want to I want to try and get in a few more questions because we're we're uh, getting towards the end of the event. So at this point, I'd like to gather maybe a couple more questions before turning back to the panelists. I think I saw Sabrina. Sabrina, did you have your hand up earlier? Sabrina, can you just make sure to enable your audio and then you can ask your question. Sabrina? Okay, maybe while Sabrina gets uh, audio working, um, the the previous question was, I guess, about people and maybe patients, patients' rights. Uh, we've not heard that much in any of the news. I mean, obviously, we, we see stories of people falling ill and going into hospital in really serious cases. But in the context of other diseases, we often have quite a lot of discussion about patients' rights and families' rights. and is that a meaningful uh, is that a meaningful concept when we're talking about a pandemic where the whole population is in a sense vulnerable? Um, uh, are you are you asking me? Yeah, anybody, anybody who wants to take that on. Again, uh, all of my answers have the same uh, caveat. It's too early to say anything. But the patient rights uh, issue, I feel like, un unlike, say, a cancer uh, patient or someone diagnosed with HIV, there is a community, there is a support group, and there are networks that already exist. Um, they, they don't function very well in most parts of the world. But then they at least exist, so there is a very basic starting point. Now, very little is known about this virus uh, at this point, and uh, it's too early. Uh, and maybe in countries with better uh, institutional uh, support, uh, uh, maybe that can be done. But in low-resource countries in Asia and Africa, we are in India. We are still uh, fighting. Uh, 
actively fighting the government in taking it to court to admit that it has local community transmission. Uh, so they are, there, there isn't enough data. The people who have COVID uh, are stigmatized and do not want to come out. Uh, landlords have evicted them. And uh, I kind of feel it's it's too early to uh, to see the kind of patient rights movement that is led by patients. Uh, I speak uh, strictly as a journalist, so the calls that I get are from uh, researchers who have been working on CTV or HIV or something else, and then they come um, uh, to this. But uh, I I I think it's too early. It'll be it'll be uh, welcome to have a group of COVID patients fighting for their rights. But sick people, it's very difficult to expect sick people to also take on the system while they are sick. So, yeah. Exactly. Um, any other thoughts on that? We have a question from Ellie, which I think would be a, a, a good note on which to maybe draw our conversation to a close. It's um, I'm conscious of time because it's very early where Donna is and it's quite late where Vidya is, so we should, uh, I'm, I'm mindful of that. But so I think maybe Ellie's question would be our last. Uh, and the question is, and the mic isn't working for Ellie, so I'll bring up the question. The question is, do you envisage any long-term social changes as a result of this pandemic? Are we going to go back to normal? And back to normal is in inverted commas in the question or to a better, different normal once this is over? Um, I would just throw that question out to everyone. And maybe I would just tack on to that a question about the geopolitics of COVID and whether you think something about the globe or about globalization is changing in this moment. Um, is that change going to be a temporary blip or is it going to rewrite, in a sense, the architecture of the world? Well, I'll jump in. Um, I think in terms of social change, I think it's difficult to gauge how things will change. Um, I'll start by uh, talking about Hurricane Katrina because I thought of this earlier in one of my answers and I didn't get to it. So I was teaching actually in New Orleans when Hurricane Katrina happened um, and looking at New Orleans. And I think having lived through that experience, I can draw a lot from that and kind of living through a pandemic and what that looks like. Um, but again, that was just New Orleans, parts of Louisiana, parts of Mississippi. So it was in this localized space. Um, so it wasn't the whole country, just as we've seen in a lot of other, particularly epidemics. But what happened in New Orleans was the city did become something else. Um, initially, of course, um, a lot of you probably saw, you know, you've read about it, you've seen the me media. Uh, while a lot of the um, the city sat in water for weeks, uh, particularly the first two weeks, most of it was in water, but parts of the city was underwater for several weeks. Uh, and so what does this look like when you have a fairly uh, large U.S. city that is basically underwater and, and you have so much structural damage, but also most people are also displaced uh, and many people never returned. But also now a lot of New Orleans has been rebuilt, but it doesn't look like it looked before. And kind of a lot of the cultural essence isn't there because a lot of the people who carry that now live all over the country. Um, and so they're no longer there. Um, but also it changed it. Uh, New, New Orleans was one of the few cities uh, in the US that didn't have a, like a large kind of corporate chain field in terms of restaurants and you know stores and boutiques and this sort of thing. It was mostly local. And now you see more of the chain, you know, you see more Whole Foods. They now have Trader Joe's and these sorts of things that they never had before. So I think we're probably, I hope that we're going to see something different from this. Um, from a public health perspective, I hope that people will finally really take this seriously. But it's hard to think that they will take this seriously. So I'll bring in the geopolitics for a minute. One of the things that I've been somewhat preoccupied with is what is happening with the World Health Organization right now. Um, and how it's been used, it's being used as a pawn basically in the middle of a global, a global pandemic. Um, and so a lot of you probably seen some of this, some of the early comments from some of the French medical professionals, uh, Dr. Tedros response to that, talking about ending colonial mentality. Very soon after he made these remarks, just a week after or so, uh, Donald Trump says that he's going to end U.S. funding 
uh, to the World Health Organization, which was very interesting because the comments weren't di directed at Trump, for instance, um, but also Trump used it to say uh, that the World Health Organization in China basically had impacted the U.S. response and to, in response to a question that he received about slow response. And so this has been going on for about six weeks now, on and off. And so just this week, um, the World Health Organization uh, held its annual World Health Assembly. It was virtual, of course, because we're in a pandemic. It was the 18th and the 19th. Uh, Trump sent a letter uh, to uh, the organization basically talking about why he wasn't giving funding, you know, kind of doubling down on what he was saying. Um, at the same time, we see leaders from around the world, uh, from Europe, from Africa, from the Caribbean, from other parts of the world who are there and who are really actively in participating in the meeting and really thinking about what this pandemic looks like, but also what other health issues look like. Um, and so during that meeting, uh, China pledged $2 billion for the next two years to the World Health Organization. Now, the amount of the money that uh, Trump was sending was $400 million. So this really eclipses this. Um, but I, I think this is something for us to think about. Um, is this something that we want to happen in the middle of a pandemic? I'm not saying that the World Health Organization is perfect, but this is not the time to fight over these sorts of things. So really thinking about investing um, in facilities, investing in gear, investing in people uh, to be able to uh, protect your populations from a public health perspective. I think this is one of the things that people hopefully now will take from this. But given what we see happening right now with this kind of fight over the World Health Organization, will that really happen? Yeah. Um, I can go next. Um, yeah. Sure. So uh, I. I've been thinking, I was listening to this lecture by Professor Snowden at Yale, and he was giving an interview to someone who asked, uh, who the, the journalist asked him the question, how come we don't remember uh, the 1918 pandemic, and how come uh, we did not see what the health workers did, and uh, this was all happening when globally there was this moment of respect for doctors and nurses. And mm -hmm. Professor Snowden said, because we don't memor memorialize them the way we do war heroes, we use a lot of mm -hmm. war metaphors, but you don't build statues to nurses and you don't, uh, you know, the essential workers who are now out there. And uh, as someone who just uh, writes uh, these stories, I, I kind of have a glass half full uh, outlook here. People forget, people forget all the time, we've forgotten pandemics. We don't learn lessons until the education system imbibes it and then teaches it to the next generation. What I do know is the people who do like to have intergenerational trauma from having survived pandemic. Mm -hmm. So you do have a lot of negative impact that stays in and a lot of positive learnings uh, don't get absorbed into these superstructures of society, which is the courts and the governments and the uh, hospitals and public health does not get uh, so it's a mix that I kind of uh, knowing Indian society and knowing some of Asian society uh, slightly better I feel like they remember the nasty bits and the good good bits the lessons that you should learn and you should come together in, in healthcare and we do need a World Health Organization that is a little more independent um, uh -huh. uh, but, uh, I, I do, I, again, it's too early to say these things, but uh, I'm generally, I'm not, uh, I don't take a very optimistic view of this uh, aspect of it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Phoebe, any last thoughts from you? Yeah, I mean, in response to the question, and it does, uh, um, uh, but I mean, things that come to mind, but I'll speak to you in terms of social change changes as a result of the pandemic. So on the one hand, I see the chasms of inequality widening. Um, I mean, uh, those uh, especially in South Africa or on the continent as general, when I speak to um, uh, friends and acquaintances across the continent, I was speaking yesterday to a friend in Ghana who was expressing similar sentiments. Um, you know, those who are on uh, um, are economically on um, level one, if you like, you know, are barely surviving, have now been dropped into the negatives. Mm -hmm. So, uh, rebuilding back to that um, will take time. So, the chasms of inequality widen. 
that way. Um, but on the other hand, uh, what has come out of here is all I've seen and witnessed. Uh, on numerous occasions, uh, uh, the various modes of community and solidarity and, uh, that have come out uh, uh, in relation to the pandemic. You know, uh, women in the townships waking up very early in the morning to peel potatoes and cut vegetables and prepare meals uh, for the school feeding program um, uh, for you know for ch um, uh, children who don't have uh, who are securely who are insecure in relation to food. Um, uh, people digging into their pockets to uh, lend a helping hand. I have friends who um, are not able to work from home. Uh, one is a winemaker and um, she's turned her house into, you know, um, uh, uh, a food production to take to communities that don't have. So these um, sense of community and solidarity um, uh, of a well, in a sense as well, you know, the kind of dedication and work we've seen from essential workers, you know, nurses and supermarket workers who have become the heroes, but the heroes now, I, I hope that that continues in a sense um, in terms of recognition um, uh, uh, in an economic sense as we go forward, um, that's a hope though. Um, uh, now, in relation to the geopolitics, I'll speak uh, specifically in relation to the continent, um, uh, the African continent. Um, I see the discourses, the rhetoric, and the narrative uh, sort of are falling within um, uh, the same terrain. Um, um, Sorry, my battery's running low. Uh, where um, you know um, it's seen as uh, the continent of black and um, you know uh, predictions around um, uh, inability to handle the pandemic um, in uh, various newspapers come up, um, forgetting that you know we managed um, uh, um, to curtail um, certain pandemics like the Ebola and. Um, we're, we're ongoing struggling with malaria and HIV. Um, and, um, you know, uh, an example out of that, of the geopolitical rhetoric remaining, uh, is um, uh, Madagascar. I don't know if you've heard, um, but it's come up a lot in the media. And um, I had the Madagascar president speak in an interview um, uh, on the French, uh, one of the French national televisions, uh, about the COVID remedy, which um, uh, is based on. Uh, organic um, uh, natural stuff that seems to work, but it's highly, highly um, uh, um, not recognized um, uh, at all um, and called, um, uh, you know, I'm not to take it uh, as something that works uh, by, uh, you know, uh, certain facets of media. And uh, another example I give is uh, that of Eritrea, um, friend of mine is a minister there and um, they've managed to curb uh, or to stop infections in relation to the COVID but you don't see this in the newspapers mm -hmm. it's like New Zealand where they managed to curb um, uh, infections uh, with the COVID and New Zealand got um, airtime um, in the global newspapers but Eritrea has it so um, I'm not that hopeful in relation to um, uh, geopolitics um, and globalization and that regard to changing uh, the smart in relation to Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm afraid we've run out of time, but I think it's been a really interesting conversation. I'm just reflecting on the answers that all three of you gave to that last question. A lot will remember, a lot will depend, I guess, on what we remember and forget, what we choose to preserve from this moment and what we um, perhaps fail to, uh, the lessons we fail to learn or the legacies we fail to, to preserve. Um, one thing that struck me somewhere in the middle of the conversation was we are having a conversation here across four continents, which is not something that I've done very much in my academic career, um, actually. And um, it's astonishing that it took a moment like this to produce a conversation, you know, that should be happening all the time around all of the issues that we think and talk about. But I'm, I'm really very grateful that you all said yes to the conversation and have brought such interesting, diverse perspectives to it from your respective vantage points. Um, and have also been thinking you know, at different levels, the global, the local, and everything in between. 
So thank you to all our speakers. Um, I hope, you know, uh, Vidya, one of your messages to me said, I hope things are better where you are. And it sounds, it seems to me like a, a, an appropriate greeting for the moment we're living in. I hope things are better where you are. Um, so thank you. Thank you again. And um, I hope we meet in better times as well. Thank you. Thank, thank you for having me over. Bye, Phoebe. Bye. It was a pleasure being on the panel with you. It was so enlightening. Yeah. Thanks for uh, bearing up with the technology, Phoebe. I hope it wasn't too uh, torturous to be on the other end of a WhatsApp call. Indeed. But thank you. No, it was all right. And we expect speech and language. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It's been a learning experience in that way as well.